I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 23. Acts, chapter 11, and verse 23. Don't you love to hear the preacher get up and say, open up your Bibles? Yeah. Amen. I'm glad he doesn't say, open up your, you know, your newspaper. Although I will agree that the newspaper is being fulfilled or the Bible's being fulfilled every day. And we're right here at the, the end of this. Amen. I'm glad that we're at the end of this. I, I like to see the end of the story. I want to see the end. And, and I'm looking forward to it. Amen. Acts chapter 11, verse 23. And it begins like this. Who, and he's speaking of Barnabas. When he came, he seen the grace of God. He, he went to the city of Antioch. And when he came to Antioch, he saw the grace of God. He was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. Barnabas goes to the city of Antioch and he finds a group of people that were freshly saved, freshly renewed, and alive for Christ. And Barnabas said, you have it. The grace of God is with you. The power of God is upon you. And so he exhorted them to continue in their gladness and exhorted them to, with purpose of heart, cleave unto the Lord. I want to use for a subject tonight, cleaving to Christ. You may be seated. Now the word cleave, actually there's a positive part to the word cleave and a negative part. Here we find the positive part of the word cleave, spelt the same. The dictionary gives us two interpretations of there's two words for cleave. Cleaving in the negative sense means to break away. I mean, you know, when people get saved, they break away from some things. It means to split or separate, to make one's way like cutting through the underbrush. Cleave means you get the word that a butcher gets for cleaver. Now, there's a positive definition to cleaving, and it is to hang on, to be glued to, to join to and keep company and to stand fast and faithful and true. So as you can see, cleaving to Jesus Christ both has a message of negative and a message of positive. Bartimaeus is using the positive sense that we are we're to be glued to Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but when I got born again, and if you got born again, you would have to say, me too, preacher. There were some things that was cut away from my life. To cleave means to, or to cleaving means to cut the underbrush, to go through, to clear out, to press through, to cut asunder, to divide. And that's exactly what God did in my life. He divided the darkness from the light. And I stepped out of darkness into God's marvelous light. When Jesus Christ comes into our life, we, there are some times that we have to just uh, take the Bible serious and cut things away from our life that God doesn't want in our life. Like the butcher uses the cleaver. And I tell people in a certain term, and I posted this on, on Facebook, that... Um, I have a Bible and I will use it. A lot of people have a Bible and they don't use it, but I have a Bible and I will use it. And many times, most of the time, I use it on myself. The Bible is strong and powerful. In fact, the Bible does some cleaving itself. According to the scripture, the word of God is quick and powerful, Hebrews 4.12, and it dividing asunder the soul and spirit. We know that everything is naked under the word of God, according to Hebrews 4.12, that it is quick and powerful. 
It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When you go to church, you're vulnerable to God. I mean, you know, going to church, you are vulnerable to God. Why? Because this is God's territory. Not that everything isn't His. But this is a place where we come together and we say, okay, God, do what God can only do. And because we're here, we're expecting God to do some incredible things in our life. Like Sunday morning, we had three come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, that's wonderful. And that's a tremendous thought when you think about people yielding to Christ and allowing God. And I can't think of a more uh, serious time than now to be ready because I don't, you know, I really believe that the church, even the church, those that are looking for Jesus Christ, the church itself that are spirit-filled, walking in the spirit, I don't even think they even know just how close we are to the coming of Jesus. It's so near. Everything is right here on the verge of the Lord's return. And it's not going to be something that you think, well, he'll descend to the clouds and we'll gradually float up to meet Jesus in the air. That, that sounds good in Sunday school and it sounds good in, uh, in, in child theology. But the truth is when Jesus Christ comes, there's going to be a cleaving. And there's going to be a dividing asunder of the atmosphere, a dividing asunder of time, space, and matter. And when Jesus Christ comes, there's going to be a shock wave and a shattering of the atmosphere above us and we will be instantly, quicker than the twinkling of an eye, a cleaving, gathering to meet Jesus Christ in the air, caught up to meet our Savior. And those left on the planet will prepare to go through one of the greatest deluges of the wrath of God that this world has ever known. Greater than the day of Noah. And the flood, greater than Sodom and Gomorrah, a time of great wrath and persecution upon the earth because people are saying no to Christ. It's a dangerous thing to say no to Christ. I said it's a dangerous thing to mock God or to live ungodly lives. In fact, Enoch said uh, that the Lord's going to return and he's going to come after them people that are ungodly, that do ungodly deeds in their ungodly way. And he used the ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. If you don't believe that, just pick whatever chapter you want to in the book of Jude, and you'll find when he knocked with priests, he prophesied that he would come and execute judgment upon the ungodly, the ungodly, the ungodly, the ungodly. How else could you explain the world today? I'm not talking about the average person that works hard and tries to make a living and feed their children. Uh, the the average person in our community, I wouldn't consider them ungodly. I, I know that if without Christ, they're sinners and they're separated from God and unrighteous. But I mean, no, there are some ungodly people in this world that despise God and, and, and detest God. And, they, uh, and not all, don't misunderstand me. I don't believe in atheism. I'm a born again child of God. But not all atheists are horrible people. They're just deceived. They're not all horrible people. They just can't wrap their mind around that there is a God. And in fact, they don't want to know there's a God. Now, there are some horrible atheists that are wicked, just like there's some religious people that are wicked. So you can't put all of them in one, can, uh, one little can and say they're all fishing worms. They're not. Hello, you can tell I wanted to warm up. I want to go fishing. But... Barnabas comes to Enoch, uh, Antioch and he says to the, the believers in Antioch, cleave to the Lord. Cleave to Christ. And I guess the question would be to cleave to, uh, we are, we've already talked about the definition of cleaving, a negative uh, meaning and also a positive meaning, uh, meaning of cleaving. But uh, uh, Barnabas is talking about a positive cleaving to the Lord. And so what does it mean to cleave to Christ? What is the cleaving to Christ? It's very clear that Barnabas said to Antioch, you are to cleave to Christ. Well, if he said it to Antioch, we're reading it in our Bible, and he's saying it to us. We're to cleave to Christ. Amen? Amen? We're to glue ourselves, laminate ourselves to Christ. You know what lamination is, don't you? Lamination is when they take some 
pieces of material, and they take a material to put it together in, in whatever form of, of material it is, plastic, wood, whatever. But when they laminate something, they take two object material and they pu push them together and they melt them together and they cleave together till they are one piece. And if you, if you pull that laminated material apart, you can't pull them apart without pulling a piece of the other with it. It is so bound together that there is no way possible to separate something that has been laminated together. And we as children of God, if we're truly born again children of God, we have been laminated to Christ. Isn't that good? All the powers of the world can't, you know, I, I, I believe with all my heart that all the destruction of this planet, all the powers of the world, all the darkness of the world, all the heartbreaks of the world cannot separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen? You might as well smile. You're stuck with Jesus Christ. He's a good God. You might as well get happy about it. You've been laminated to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't be unlaminated once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a process where you cease to believe. If you ever cease to believe, you never believed to begin with. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, well, I used to believe, but I don't believe anymore. And I said, either you're really sick in the head or you're lying to me. And he said, what do you mean sick in the head? The truth is, if you really believe on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you can't unbelieve that. Because if you really believe in him, nothing's going to tear you and pull you away from that structure. The Bible says we have no man that should teach us. We know who we are in Christ. We know he's real. Amen. Is there anybody in this room that's a born again child of God? Is there anybody in this room? Could you be talked out of your Love for Jesus? Could you be talked out of your life for Christ? Could you be talked about out of going to heaven? Could you, be, could you be forced out of it? You may be threatened, but the Holy Ghost will give you strength, even if it means to be martyred. The Spirit of God will give you grace. Amen? It's like the preacher that was about to go, the airplane was about to crash, and everybody was grabbing the seats and screaming, and, and the air Mass fell in there, and the uh, airplane was shaking. It looked like they were going to crash. Preacher just, just sitting there, just as calm. And the lady next to him said, Preacher, weren't you scared? He said, I was terrified. But he said, I knew I wasn't going to die because God hadn't given me the grace to die. He said, the reason I knew I wasn't going to die is because I was terrified. Now, if God brings you to a place that you're going to leave, you'll be ready for it. Amen. I prayed, to, I prayed with a lot of sick folk in my life, terminally ill, and when they reach the place they're ready and there's no more fear and they desire to go, that's the grace of God. So that's the grace of God. Right now I'm not going to die because I don't have that grace to die right now. I've got the grace to preach to you tonight, but I don't have the grace to die yet. If God gives it to me in the next two or three minutes, then I'll be concerned. Right? Hello. And so, what does it mean to cleave to the Lord? Well, how do we do it? And I'm going to give you three little thoughts on how we cleave to the Lord. By prayerful dependence upon Him. By prayerful dependence upon Jesus Christ, we cleave to the Lord. In fact, Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, speaking of God, for they that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we please God because we have faith in God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 says, and I love this verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's a great verse. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I'll come back to that verse in a minute. But look at what Jesus Christ said in the last part of verse 5 of St. John 15. The last few words that Jesus spoke in that verse 5 of St. John 15 says, For without me you can do nothing. Notice that. For without me you can do nothing. Before that he's speaking about fruit and producing and be fruitful for the Lord. But he said, without me you can do nothing. Amen? So uh, Jesus is saying... Don't lose your can-do. 
Don't lose your can do. Because you can do as long as you have Christ. But without me, you can do nothing. Amen? And so Paul tells the church of Philippi, he says, I can do all things. We can do all things through Christ which strengthened us. I can do. How many know God put the can do in every born again believer in this room? Hello? Amen? I like can do. How many like can do? I like can mountain do too. But anyway, a lot of things can. Canned beans and canned pork and beans and canned beef and canned uh, pop and canned juice and canned, uh, you know. But I, I like the can do better than any of them. Amen? This chapter in Philippians 4 is talking about rejoicing in the Lord and praying and keeping good thoughts. Did you know you can defeat yourself before you ever step out to do a job for God? You can defeat yourself in your mind. You can defeat yourself and say, I can't. There's no way I can. And, and I'm glad that Jesus Christ said, you can do all things. Now, you can do nothing without, without Christ, but you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. Amen? Let me tell you, friends, when those vacuum salesmen come to your door, they've got the can-do in them. Amen? You might as well forget trying to be a salesman if you ain't got the can-do in you. you got to know. Amen? And, if, and they know from the start, a salesman, a vacuum salesman, or whatever, you know, an uh, uh, encyclopedia salesman. You heard about that guy in the encyclopedia he, was a, he, he, he stuttered. He couldn't talk very good. And it, just, it, it, it took him forever to get a word out. And, and he started selling so many encyclopedias. They said, how do you do it? You're selling more than anybody in our whole firm. You're selling. You're the top salesman. He said, how can you do it? You, 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 you can't get a word out. How in the world is this guy selling? He said, it's easy. I just go to the door and ring the bell and say, would you like to buy some some, 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 some encyclopedia would you like for me to read it to you and so they buy them quickly they didn't want him to read it to them hello people that sell things are pumped up they have meetings to pump them up I mean I mean, know what I'm talking about they have meetings to pump them up amen and God knew that you're kind of like that. You know, you're not selling Christ, but you are presenting Christ. And so he has to get you in church on Wednesday night because you're flopping half, half aired up and into here. And, and, and the preaching's got to be in the singing. And we've got to try to pump you up so you can walk out of here with the air and the power of God. Amen. Hello. Amen. I'm sure you heard the illustration. People come in with a leak and and the preacher gets up with one of them air pumps and trying to pump them up and, and, and trying to get your, your, your wheel up so that you can drive. Well, that's kind of how I feel tonight. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Bless God. Amen. If God requires you to do something, he'll give you the can-do to do it. If God wants you to quit something or start something, he'll give you the can-do to do it. You say, well, I'm discouraged and I'm depressed. Well, God will give you the can-do. He'll fill you up. He'll bless you. He'll give you strength. You can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. Amen. And that's part of cleaving to Jesus. The second thing we need to do to cleave to Jesus is by living by faith. We need to live by faith. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And I love this next sentence. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. And that faith is of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I love this scripture. I'm crucified with Christ. I've, been, I've died with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. It's not me that lives, but it's Christ that lives inside of me. Christ lives inside of every born-again child of God. Amen. He's alive in you. That's why 
Uh, that's why Barnabas said, I have purpose of heart, cleaving to the Lord, purpose of heart, from your heart. And I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what he does in my life. They preach it to you flop and fail sometimes. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about how great God is. Amen. Well, I'd rather talk about your problem. Not me. I want to talk about how good God is. Amen. Amen. The last thing I want to do is go to church and hear some preacher talk about, oh, woe is me. We ain't ever going to make it. I'm going through such a hard time. The devil's beating the devil out of me. I don't like to hear sermons like that. I like to hear people get there. Whoa, God's good. We can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. Amen. The people can talk themselves out of greatness because they're so bummed out, so weary, and, so, and, and, and they're at a place where they don't have that energy and that strength. Because they're discouraged. And the Bible says, I'm crucified with Christ. I died, but yet not I. I live, but it's not me. It's Jesus living inside of me. Amen? Amen. Jesus lives inside me. I've shared this, this before. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And it's kind of like, did you, know, did you know my heart lives in this thumb? My heart lives in this thumb. You know how I know that? I can smash it with a hammer, and every time my heart beats, boom, boom, my heart lives in your thumb, boom. Right? Hello? And Christ liveth in me. I love this. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live it by faith in the Son of God. The life I live now, I live by faith. Meaning, I died to the old life. Christ lives inside of me. Jesus Christ is my life. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. By faith in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why he told the church of Corinth, Apostle Paul did. He said to Corinth, For we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You ought to put this on your refrigerator. You ought to put this scripture on your refrigerator. You ought to put this scripture on your dashboard, on your car. You ought to put this scripture on, on, on front of your Bible. You ought to put, memorize this scripture because in parentheses, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Oh, I had a grandma die. We walk by faith. And not by sight. Oh, I've got a friend that's dying. I've got a, a friend that's sick. We walk by faith. And not by sight. Oh, I'm going through a storm. I'm going to that verse will fit anywhere in your life. Anything that comes your way, we walk by faith and not by sight. Parentheses. But we walk by faith and not by sight. It's interesting in this scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, he's talking about to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's talking about death. He's talking about the highest calamity that all of us face would be death. But we walk by faith and not by sight. If we're standing in the graveyard, we walk by faith and not by sight. If we're at a hospital bed and someone is breathing their last breath, we walk by faith and not by sight. If we're in a storm and it looks like we're not going to pull through and, and we're just sick in body and we're, we're troubled in our heart, we walk by faith and not by sight. Because how many know sight isn't always a good thing? What you see isn't always encouraging. What you see around you is not always uplifting. But faith is always Charging my batteries. Faith is always exciting my soul. We walk by faith, not by sight. We crawl out of bed the next morning by faith, not by sight. We live by the life of Christ. We walk by faith and not by a cup of coffee. Amen? Now, 
I know there's coffee drinkers in here. I know I just almost nigh get beat half to death when I say something about coffee. I know there's coffee drinkers in here. You're coffee holics, what you are. And I just don't like coffee. I'll be honest with you. When I get older, I might acquire a taste for it. But I'm going to have to get older and colder to like it. Amen? I'll not tell you what my mom and dad used to tell me it would do to you as a little boy. Amen. Come on. Now, I'm preaching better than you're responding. I know what Judy's dad used to tell him, and I can't say that in public. <laughs> Cleaving to the Lord by prayer, dependence upon Him, prayerful dependence upon Him, by living by faith, number three, and this is the last one, by waiting for the Lord. By waiting for the Lord. Hey, there's something better about to happen. Amen? There's something bigger than this world. There's something better about to happen. Jesus is going to return. Amen? Isaiah 40, verse 1, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and be not weary. They shall walk and not faint. But here I want to say this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait. No matter what you're going through, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And to wait. Everybody tells me, all the world's falling apart and we're going to fry and die. No, I'm waiting for the coming of our Lord. Amen? I'm just going to wait. Oh, but preacher, we got to go through all kinds of hard times. I don't know about you, but I've been tripping for quite some time. And, you know, uh, I understand there's great persecution. I understand there could be horrible things happen to us. But when he's talking about the wrath of God, he's not talking about Satan's wrath. He's not talking about Satan's do doing. He's talking about God's wrath. Save us from the wrath to come. Which the Bible says Jesus, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's not the wrath of the devil. That's the wrath of God. And we've been redeemed from the wrath of God. One day I'll stand before God and Jesus Christ will tell the Father, He's mine. And if you're a born again child of God, you give your heart to Jesus Christ, when it comes judgment day, your lawyer, your advocate, your mediator, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gonna stand between you and the Holy Father and say, this one is mine. Yeah, we understand that when the church is taken. Notice it says, which delivered us. That word, it, that word deliver means past tense. It doesn't mean which shall deliver us. It doesn't say which shall deliver us. It says which delivered us. See, that's not a future connotation. He said when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary and rose again from the grave, he's not going to deliver us. He did deliver us. It's not a coming deliverance. It's already happened. Which delivered us from what? The wrath to come. Amen. What wrath is he talking about? He's talking about once God takes the church home, God will judge this planet. And it will be a horrendous wrath. But God's a good God. I said last Sunday morning, I said God's not the author of volcanoes. God's not sending earthquakes. God's not sending great calamities on the earth. God's not a bad God. God's a good God. He gave his son Jesus Christ so we could go to heaven. But one day we're going to be caught up to meet Jesus Christ in the air and all the God forsakers and all the God haters and all the unbelievers will have to face God and he's not going to be in a good mood. Hello. Somebody can I get a witness? And so I'm delivered from the wrath which is to come. I'm delivered from hell. I had a guy tell me one time, go to hell. 
And I said, I can't. He said, what? I said, I can't go to hell. He said, why can't you? I said, because Jesus saved me, born me again. I'm a child of God. I can't go to hell. He lost it. I mean, you could tell empty up here, just gone. It was gone. It just like, it, I might as well just took a, a wet fish and slapped him upside the face. I mean, it just, you know, you know. And finally, as he's walking, he says, we'll go to heaven then. And I said, I will, thank you. Please hear me. There is coming a great judgment day. Please hear me. There is coming a great wrath. Please hear me. There's coming a day in which God will judge the world. But he sent his son Jesus so that nobody on this planet will have to be judged under his wrath. Jesus died for all, not just one of us. And that's my job and your job to tell everybody, get ready, get ready. And so because of that, I'm going to cleave to the Lord. Amen? I'm going to cleave to the Lord. I'm going to hang on. And if something tries to attach me, I'm going to pull out my cleaver and chop it off. If I need to go through the underbrush and do some cleaving so I can get through there, I'm going to do it. I have my Bible and I will use it. But the thing that I'm going to do in a positive sense is I'm going to cleave to Jesus Christ. The closer we get to the coming of Jesus, the more I'm going to cleave to Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm going to be laminated to Jesus Christ. I'm going to be one with him. And if you're one with him, you're never going to be separated. I'm going to be in him and him in me. Amen? You know, well, preacher, you're just talking about a powerful God. I know, isn't it great? He said, preacher, you're just talking like we can go to heaven if we want to. I know. Isn't it great? Yeah, but preacher, you're just talking like, man, you just come to God and he's so powerful and nothing can separate us from the love of God and, and we're going to make it through and we're going to go to heaven because we put our trust in the blood, the crucifixion, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Preacher, you just sound like God's big and God's powerful. I know. Isn't it great? And so I want to encourage everybody in this room, cleave to the Lord. Barnabas said to Antioch, cleave to the Lord. With a purpose in heart, cleave to the Lord. And I have a purpose in my heart, and I want to always cleave to the Lord. Josh, come and bring a song. We're going to invite you. I don't know how soon the Lord's going to come and bring forth his great judgment upon the planet. I know he did it on the cross so that you and I could be saved. I don't know when he's going to come and take his church home. I don't know exactly when it's going to transpire. But this one thing I know for sure. He has delivered us from the wrath which is to come. And thank God we're going somewhere. Amen. Sunday night I preached on it. Is anybody seen my shoes has anybody found my shoes and I just say I'm putting them on because we're going somewhere stand with me altars open